interesting conversation related in the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna in August of 1884. Hazra, one of Sri Ramakrishna's uh, sort of devotees, said, uh, Narendra is again involved in a lawsuit. Sri Ramakrishna said, he doesn't believe in Shakti, the Divine Mother. If one assumes a body, one must recognize her. Hazra replied, Narendra says, if I believed in Shakti, all would follow me, therefore I cannot. Sri Ramakrishna, but it is not good for him to go to the extreme of denying the Divine Mother. He is now under Shakti's jurisdiction. Even a judge, while giving evidence in a case, comes down and stands in the witness box. We're reminded here, I'm reminded at least, of Sri Ramakrishna's uh, teacher of non-dual Vedanta, Totapuri, who, also, who was well established in, uh, he was a, a knower of God, a knower of Brahman, an awakened, illumined soul. And yet he did not accept the different deities. He did not accept Mother Kali, thinking that there, after all, all the, even the deities are um, anitya, impermanent. They merge back into the, into the infinite Brahman. Uh, and yet he finally had to accept the mother. As we recall, he, he was unable to remain in samadhi. He was established in samadhi, but then he got dysentery, and the pain of the stomach cramps dragged his mind back to the body. And he decided he would drown himself in the Ganges. So one night, he just walked out into the Ganges to drown himself. Somehow, he was walking on a sandbar, and he couldn't find water deep enough in which to drown himself. <laughs> and suddenly, his heart opened, and he realized that this was all the Divine Mother's play, and that as long as he had a body, he was in, under the jurisdiction of the Divine Mother. So he became a devotee also of Divine Mother. Anyhow, uh, back to Narendra Nath and, and Sri Ramakrishna. Surely Sri Ramakrishna would be encouraging Narendra to accept the Divine Mother. And uh, interestingly, Narendra told him uh, why? I have meditated on Kali for three or four days, but nothing has come of it. So we sense that he's trying to uh, accept the mother. And we also smile a little. If to meditate for three or four days and expect a result, it seems a little naive. And yet again, Swami Vivekananda being the perfected yogi that he was, we should expect something, perhaps, after just three or four days meditation. Sri so Ramakrishna replied to him, all in good time, my child. Kali is none other than Brahman. That which is called Brahman is really Kali, the primal energy. When that energy remains inactive, I call it Brahman. When it creates, preserves, or destroys, I call it Shakti or Kali. What you call Brahman, I call Kali. Sri Ramakrishna used to repeat this in, in different ways, that the infinite, unconditioned, absolute reality called Brahman is also inseparable from Shakti, that which creates or manifests this world of names and forms. And he used to say it was like uh, fire and its burning power. You can't separate the burning power of fire from fire. You can't separate the whiteness of milk from milk. You can't separate uh, the wriggling motion of a snake from the snake itself. Likewise, you cannot separate Brahman and Shakti. So he would say, it is Brahman whom I address as Shakti, which means power, or Kali. So finally came the great turning point. And actually, there are three great turning points in Vivekananda's life in relation to the mother. We'll take up each one of these in turn. This first one, uh, Narendra became desperate to solve his problem, his financial problems, and how to feed the family. Uh, he approached Sri Ramakrishna for help. And I'll read a little bit of a lengthy uh, quote from Swami Vivekananda himself on what happened. He says, one day the idea struck me that God listened to Sri Ramakrishna's prayers. So why should I not ask him to pray for me for the removal of my pecuniary needs, a favor the master would never deny me? I hurried to Dakshineshwar and insisted on his making the appeal on behalf of my starving family. He said, my boy, 
I can't make such demands. But why don't you go and ask the mother yourself? All your sufferings are due to your disregard of her. I said, I do not know the mother. You please speak to her on my behalf. You must. He, rep he replied tenderly, my boy, I have done so again and again. But you do not accept her. So she does not grant my prayer. All right, it is Tuesday. Tuesday, of course, is a day especially sacred. Tuesdays and Saturdays, sacred to the mother. All right, it is Tuesday. Go to the Kali temple tonight. Prostrate yourself before the mother and ask of her any boon you like. It shall be granted. She is knowledge absolute, the inscrutable power of Brahman. By her mere will, she has given birth to this world. Everything is in her power to give. Vivekananda continues, I believed every word and eagerly waited for the night. About nine o'clock, the master asked me to go to the temple. As I went, I was filled with a divine intoxication. My feet were unsteady. My heart was leaping in anticipation of the joy of beholding the living goddess and hearing her words. I was full of the idea. Reaching the temple, as I cast my eyes on the image, I actually found that the divine mother was living and conscious, the perennial fountain of divine love and beauty. I was caught in a surging wave of devotion and love. In an ecstasy of joy, I prostrated myself again and again before the mother and prayed, Mother, give me viveka, discernment. Give me vairagya, renunciation. Give me knowledge and devotion. Grant that I may have the uninterrupted vision of thee. A serene peace reigned in my soul. The world was forgotten, only the Divine Mother shone in my heart. So the Mother became real to him. This was a, 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 a real turning point, a, a, an experience of, of God realization described in his own words. So he returned to Sri Ramakrishna's room and the first thing Sri Ramakrishna said to him was, well, did you ask mother? Did you ask her about uh, your financial difficulties? I forgot all about it. <laughs> he had forgotten completely about it. I, I, what should I do now? Go, go back, ask her again. So again, Narendra Nath went to the Kali temple. And again, he was overwhelmed with love for the mother and bowed down again and again at her feet and begged her only for love and devotion. Coming back to Sri Ramakrishna's room, again, oh, still overcome in ecstasy, again Sri Ramakrishna said, okay, did you ask her this time? Again he had to say, oh, I forgot. Uh, and uh, he said, how thoughtless. Couldn't you restrain yourself enough to say those few words? Well, try once more and make that prayer. Go. So Narendra Nath went a third time to the Kali temple. And this time, he was overcome by a feeling of shame, a terrible shame. And as he puts it, he thought, what a trifle I have come to pray to the mother about. It is like, it is like asking a gracious king for a few vegetables. What a fool I am. In shame and remorse, I bowed to her respectfully and said, mother, I want nothing but knowledge and devotion. So this was uh, the, the, the first great turning point in Vivekananda's life, where he realized who is mother, the grantor of knowledge and devotion, the em embodiment of infinite love. And uh, of course, as in a, we, can, we can say that uh, then Narendra came to Sri Ramakrishna and insisted, he understood that uh, Sri, Ra it's Sri Ramakrishna, who is, this is part of his play, uh, and uh, I suppose a test also. And he insisted that Sri Ramakrishna grant that his family not suffer so much. And after repeatedly insisting and forcing him, as it were, um, first Sri Ramakrishna said, I asked you to pray for yourself. You couldn't do it. It seems that you are not destined to enjoy worldly happiness. What can I do about it? But uh, he wouldn't let him go. So finally he said, all right, your family will not lack basic food and clo uh, clothing. Your, your base, their basic needs, they will have it. So uh, 
Anyhow, Sri Ramakrishna was utterly thrilled that Narendra had accepted the mother, and he taught him a song, uh, which is Ma Tong Hitara, O Mother, Thou art our sole redeemer. Thou the support of the three gunas, higher than the most high. It's a beautiful song, and he spent the whole night up singing it in ecstasy, singing this song again and again and again. Uh, the next day, one devotee uh, visited Sri Ramakrishna around noon and found Narendranath sleeping outside. And he, he visited Sri Ramakrishna, and Sri Ramakrishna was overjoyed. He said, look here, that boy, Narendra, that boy is exceptionally good. His name is Narendra. He would not accept the Divine Mother before, but did so yesterday. He is in straitened circumstances nowadays, so I advised him to pray to the mother for riches, but he couldn't. He said he was put to shame. Returning from the temple, he asked me to teach him a song to the mother, which I did. The whole of last night he sang that song, so he is sleeping now. Then with unfeigned delight, he said, isn't it wonderful that Narendra has accepted the mother? Finally, the disciple had accepted the guru's mother. What actually happened on that night, we can only guess. Sist much later, he let fall a few hints. Sister Nivedita recorded them. He said, how I used to hate Kali and all her ways. That was the ground of my six years fight, that I would not accept her. But I had to accept her at last. Ramakrishna Paramahamsa dedicated me to her, and I now believe that she guides me in everything I do and does with me what she will. Yet I fought so long. I loved him, you see, and that was what held me. I saw his marvelous purity. I felt his wonderful love. His greatness had not dawned on me then. All that came afterwards when I had given in. At that time, I thought him a brain-sick baby, always seeing visions and the rest. I hated it. And then I, too, had to accept her. No, he continues, no, the thing that made me do it is a secret that will die with me. I had great misfortunes at the time. It was an opportunity. She made a slave of me. Those were the very words a slave of you, and Ramakrishna Paramahamsa made me over to her. So it seems that uh, Narendranath heard the direct words of the Divine Mother and was made her slave. The details, however, uh, Vivekananda was unwilling to divulge. Uh, let's turn now to the second turning point in uh, Vivekananda's life, which is still as Narendra. This is a few days before Sri Ramakrishna left the body in 1886. He cemented that relationship of Narendra Nath with the mother. And Vivekananda related much later. In 1901, he related what happened on that night uh, to his disciple Chandra Chakravarti, which is recorded in uh, the books. Uh, his, uh, Vivekananda was tired out from so much work. His, his, he had completed his world mission, more or less. And uh, his disciple was encouraging him to take a sabbatical. Go take, go take some rest. Take a sabbatical. Take some leave. Recover your health. And uh, Vivekananda replied, My son, there is no rest for me. That which Sri Ramakrishna called Kali, took possession of my body and soul three or four days before his passing away. That makes me work and work and never lets me keep still or look to my personal comfort. Two or three days before the master's passing away, he called me to his side when alone and making me sit before him, gazed intently into my eyes and entered into samadhi, into superconscious absorption. I then actually perceived a powerful current of subtle force entering into me, like electricity from his body. I, after a time, I too lost all outward consciousness and was merged in samadhi. So the guru and the disciple, it seems, became one in uh, superconscious absorption. How long I was in that state, I cannot say. When I came down to the sense plane, I found the master weeping on being asked, 
Why? He said with great tenderness, O oh, my Naren, I have now become a fakir, a beggar, by giving away my all and everything to you. By the force of this shakti, this power, you will do many great things in this world, and only after that will you go back. It seems to me, now Vivekananda talking again, he says, it seems to me that it is that power that makes me work and work, whirling me, as it were, in its vortex. This body is not made for sitting idle. We remember how Sri Ramakrishna said, if Narendranath comes to know who he is, he will give up his body. So the mother has kept a, veil, kept a veil over his eyes so he doesn't know who he is. And yet, that veil is so thin, so very thin, it may be rent at any time. So we may ask, uh, clearly uh, from these uh, accounts, we understand that Vivekananda was utterly dedicated to the mother and looked on her as the, ma the master who was guiding him and even making him work, making him do, do everything. So why then did he not tell the world about her? Why did he not proclaim her from, from the pulpit, as it were? Why did he keep her a secret? It seems that he made a distinction between his own personal life, his own spiritual attitude, which was very private, and his message which was for all people in all cultures. He wrote to his dear American sister, Mary Hale, in 1900, Kali worship is not a necessary step in any religion. The Upanishads teach us all there is of religion. Kali worship is my special fad. You never heard me preach it or read of my preaching it in India. I only preach what is good for universal humanity. If there is any curious method which implies entirely to me, I keep it a secret and there it ends. So uh, Vivekananda was clearly conscious of his role as a world teacher, a bearer of a message to all humanity, the message of the reality of the divine and the the divinity of the soul and the harmony of religions. So he was careful to broadcast only principles, not personalities, to preach only that which would invigorate and inspire and bring all humanity towards our common destiny. He continues in this letter to Mary Hale, religion is that which does not depend on books or teachers, or prophets, or saviors, and that which does not make us dependent in this or in any other lives upon others. In this sense, Advaitism, that means non-duality, of the Upanishads is the only religion. But saviors, books, prophets, ceremonials, etc. have their places. They may help many, as Kali worship helps me in my secular work. They are welcome. Evidently, uh, Vivekananda was responding to an inquiry, a query by Mary Hale about Kali worship. And uh, the image of Kali was used by Christian missionaries to demonize Hinduism because, uh, and we'll come a little more to that shortly, but uh, we, we know that the image is a little bit disconcerting with the severed heads and the sword. And so uh, it was used by Christian missionaries to demonize Hinduism and to encourage uh, the Americans to uh, give money to the missionaries so they could uh, convert the fallen heathens uh, to Christianity from that terrible religion called Hinduism, which worships uh, this gruesome Kali. Uh, so it's no wonder that he just kept quiet. He didn't uh, engage Mary or didn't answer her question, only uh, this much, which is, uh, it gives, does give us a, a deep insight into uh, Vivekananda's uh, attitude. So though he did not discuss or teach Kali publicly, but to his intimate disciples in Thousand Island Park, he did teach them about mother. And I'd like to read a few excerpts of those teachings. Uh, 
Very interesting. We see in these teachings a tension between looking on mother as a principle, as embodying the all, and on the other hand, as a person, as a person we can know and talk to. He taught them, the Divine Mother is the Kundalini, the coiled up power sleeping in us. Without worshiping her, we can never know ourselves. All merciful, all powerful, omnipresent are attributes of Divine Mother. She is the sum total of the energy in the universe. Every manifestation of power in the universe is Mother. She is life, she is intelligence, she is love. So here we see the principle, the, the, the uh, principle of the absolute, of all power being a manifestation of Mother. And yet, again, he teaches, she is in the universe, yet separate from it. She is a person and can be seen and known as Sri Ramakrishna saw and knew her. Established in the idea of Mother, we can do anything. She quickly answers prayer. Again, giving us a, a great encouragement. She can show herself to us in any form at any moment. Divine Mother can have form and name or name without form. And as we worship her in these various aspects, we can rise to pure being, having neither form nor name. The sea calm is the absolute. The same sea in waves is the Divine Mother. She is time, space, and causation. A bit of mother, a drop, was Krishna. Another was Buddha, another was Christ. Worship her if you want love and devotion. Finally, the jnani says, I will uncover God by force. The approach of jnana, of wisdom. I will uncover God by force. But the dualist says, I will uncover God by praying to mother, begging her to open the door to which she alone has the key. So this is the beautiful conception we get of uh, the divine as mother, as the all, the totality, and yet again as the all blissful and beneficent mother, the, uh, the, the, our own mother, a person, As the verse says, Sarva Mangala Mangale, O Mother, who art the auspiciousness of all auspicious things. But what about that bloody garland of severed heads around her neck? What of her girdle fashioned of severed human arms? What about that blood trickling from the corners of her mouth, as described in the meditation verses on Mother Kali? The devotees. Most often we give symbolic interpretations of these, or we just, we don't look at those. We, we look at mother's, mother's granting boons and, she, and fearlessness, and we don't look at that part. Or as Swami Swahanandaji used to say, who wants a Nambi Pambi mother? Mother is there to protect us. Her sword protects us from evil. Well, the symbolic interpretation, one symbolic interpretation is that the sword is the sword of knowledge. And that severed head that she holds in her, in her lower left hand is the uh, head of our ego of ignorance. And with the sword of knowledge, she uh, severs our ignorance, our head of ignorance, and frees us. But there's more. Her girdle of arms is, is, is symbolic of how she cuts our karma. It's with our arms that we work. When she cuts our, the, the cut arms are, she cuts our karma and releases us. There's more though. In the image of Kali we find, as Nikila, as Nikila Nanda writes, a glorious harmony of the pairs of opposites. If she is the power of Brahman, if she is the time, space, and causation, then she is everything then she must be all good. But what about bad? She must be a manif she, the bad must also be a manifestation of mother. The terrible must also be within her. She also destroys as well as creates. The whole universe, with its joy and misery, is the play, the lila, the manifestation of the mother. 
And what we want to say is that's all well and good, but as the young uh, Swami Turiyananda, as Hari Asti Ramakrishna, that's all well and good, but this play of God is our death. And Sri Ramakrishna answers, please tell me who you are. Tell me who you are. God alone has become all this. Maya, the universe, living beings, and the 24 cosmic principles. As the snake I bite, and as the charmer I cure. This is a difficult conception of the divine, to look on everything as coming from God, and yet it's a grand vision. There is no devil to explain the existence of evil. Good and evil are just two faces of the absolute. It's a mature outlook, a mature attitude. Sri Ramakrishna says, this world is the leela of God. It is like a game. In this game, there are joy and sorrow, virtue and vice, knowledge and ignorance, good and evil. The game cannot continue if sin and suffering are altogether eliminated from the creation. This is the perfect wisdom, that God has become all this. Nothing exists but the divine. And good and evil are only relative. They're different sides of one coin. A profound time came in Swami Vivekananda's life when he focused on the terrible as also coming from the mother. This was a period of intense seeking, culminating in his third transforming experience of the mother. It took place in 1898. Swami Vivekananda had made the pilgrimage to Amarnath, the great uh, Himalayan cave temple to Lord Shiva, and there had received the boon from Lord Shiva himself not to die until he himself had willed it. He was with Sister Niverita. And afterwards, coming back down from there, his attention started to shift from Shiva to the mother. And Nivedita writes about it. He, she writes, he was always singing the songs of Ram Prasad, as if he would saturate his own mind with the conception of himself as a child. He told some of us once that wherever he turned, he was conscious of the presence of the mother, as if she were a person in the room. Gradually, however, his absorption became more intense. Now he seemed to fasten his whole attention on the dark, the painful, and the inscrutable in the world, with the determination to reach by this particular road the one behind all phenomena. The worship of the terrible now became his whole cry. Illness or pain would draw from him the, the reminder that she is the organ, she is the pain, and she is the giver of pain. Kali, Kali, Kali. And this uh, intensity reached a culmination when he wrote that poem. His brain was teeming with thoughts, she writes. He said, he said one day, his brain was teeming with thoughts and his fingers would not rest till they were written down. It was that same evening that we came back to our houseboat from some expedition and found waiting for us where he had called and left them his manuscript lines on Kali the mother. Writing in a fever of inspiration, he had fallen on the floor when he had finished, as we learned afterwards, exhausted with his own intensity. This poem uh, seems to encapsulate a, a, a kind of terrifying and yet uh, utterly thrilling conception of the mother. And Vivekananda himself, after writing it, collapsed on the floor in exhaustion. I'd like to read it out as best I can. The stars are blotted out. The clouds are covering clouds. It is darkness, vibrant, sonant. In the roaring, whirling wind, are the souls of a million lunatics just loose from the prison house, wrenching, excuse me, let me start again. I got a little too excited. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a powerful poem. Here we go. The stars are blotted out. The clouds are covering clouds. It is darkness, vibrant, sonant. In the roaring, whirling wind are the souls of a million lunatics just loose from the prison house 
wrenching trees by the roots, sweeping all from the path. The sea has joined the fray and swirls up mountain waves to reach the pitchy sky. The flash of lurid light reveals on every side a thousand thousand shades of death, begrimed and black, scattering plagues and sorrows, dancing mad with joy. Come, mother, come. For terror is thy name, death is in thy breath, and every shaking step destroys a world for error. Thou time, the all-destroyer, come, O mother, come. Who dares misery love and hug the form of death, dance in destruction's dance. To him the mother comes. After this, uh, Vivekananda spent a week at a famous shrine to the Divine Mother called Kshir Bhavani, the mother who is worshipped with uh, milk, uh, condensed milk, practicing intense spiritual disciplines. And of this period, he said, it all came true, every word of it. Who dares misery love, dance in destruction's dance, and hug the form of death? To him, the mother does indeed come, I have proved it, for I have hugged the form of death. It was also at Kshir Bhavani that he heard the voice of the mother. He relates how he had been pondering over the ruination and desecration of the temple. The temple had been uh, desecrated by earlier invaders, earlier Muslim invaders who, of course, we know just didn't understand image worship at all. Uh, so distressed at heart, thinking of that desecration of the mother's temple, he thought to himself, how could the people have permitted such a sacrilege without offering strenuous resistance? If I were here then, I would have never have allowed such things. I would have laid down my life to protect the mother. And then he heard the mother speak. Nivedita describes how he relates this experience. He, she writes, he entered our houseboat, a transfigured presence, and silently passed from one to another, blessing us and putting marigolds on our heads. I offered them to mother, he said at last, as he ended by handing the garland to one of us. Then he sat down. No more hurry home, it is all mother now, he said with a smile. We all sat silent. Had we tried to speak, we should have failed, so tense was the spot, with something that stilled thought. He opened his lips again. All my patriotism is gone. Everything is gone. Now it's only mother, mother. I have been very wrong, he said after another pause. Mother said to me, what? Even if unbelievers should enter my temples and defile my images, what is that to you? Do you protect me or do I protect you? So there is no more patriotism. I am only a little child. It's amazing. Through the worship of the terrible, he became transfigured and came to this. If I had been alive in that time, I would have protected the mother. I would have laid down my life to protect the mother. What? Who protects whom? Do you protect me or do I protect you? It's all mother. So this very powerful poem and this amazing experience which followed it, uh, What more to say about it? It's, it's, uh, uh, we find uh, Swami Vivekananda tried to express in this poem some aspects of the, ter the terrible aspect of the divine. Uh, it's a unity. It's a unity of both the good and the bad. And perhaps that's why this conception of Kali is so satisfying. It's a complete picture. Nothing is left out. Is the divine infinite, is the absolute behind everything? Then we must be able to see the mother not only in the good, but also in the bad. In the, we should say not the good and bad, but the seemingly good and the seemingly bad. Back of creation and preservation, back of annihilation as well. 
and as time the all-destroyer, the desi- divine conceit of as time. In this world, time destroys everything. The clock never stops ticking. And all our hopes and all our joys and all our sorrows and all our dreams and all our fears, everything is swallowed up by time. Kali is the great devourer, crushing out entire worlds with every shaking step. Vivekananda wrote another poem in Bengali on Mother Kali. This poem was written in English. Uh, It's a long poem. We're not going to go into it, but just the last two verses, I'll read the translation. Nachuk tahate shama, let shama dance there, is the title of the poem. Awake, O hero, forsake dreams. Death stands at your head. Does fear behoove thee? This world full of sorrow is the body of God. His temple, the abode of ghouls in the midst of funeral powers, pow- pyres. His worship, perpetual battle, albeit always in defeat. Fear not. Let all desires, self, fame, go. The heart be turned into a burning ground. And let Shama dance there. This beautiful image of the heart. We know that Mother Kali dances in the cremation ground. Turn our heart into a cremation ground. And what do we burn there? We burn the corpses of these empty dreams that we live on. The empty dreams that we shall somehow be happy if we only get a good house and a good wife or a good husband or uh, get our daughter or son married. And then we shall be all right and then we shall be happy. These dreams are but uh, bondages. Can we sacrifice all these desires? Can we let the mother crush them under her feet, burn them in a big conflagration in our heart, and that becomes a cremation ground where the mother comes and dances. Then the mother comes. In the cremation ground of the heart, we burn the corpses of our desires, our hankering for name and fame, for lust and gold. And in that desolation, the mother comes and dances. This worship of the terrible, or at least acceptance of the terrible, brings a great freedom. It brings a great boldness, a fearlessness, a great dispassion, a detachment, vairagya. No more will we be attracted by the false glitter of this world. Then we want that. We want her who is the source. Vivekananda said, you see, I cannot but believe that there is somewhere a great power that thinks of herself as feminine and called Kali and mother. And I believe in Brahman too. But is it not always like that? Is it not the multitude of cells in the body that make up the personality? The many brain centers, not the one that produce consciousness? Unity and complexity. Just so. And why should it be different with Brahman? It is Brahman. It is the one. And yet, and yet it is the gods too. This reconciliation of Brahman and Kali, we find that paradoxically, that which seems that it cannot be reconciled is reconciled in uh, Vivekananda in his teachings. I believe in Brahman and the gods, he says, and not in anything else. He says, well, let's turn now to uh, the final day, July 4th, 1902. Swami Vivekananda went early in the morning to the shrine, the temple, and locked the doors and locked himself inside for three hours. He had never done this, and everyone was surprised. He locked the doors, and what happened in that time we can only guess. Afterwards, he came out of the shrine, walking down the steps, singing this song of Kamalakanta. Is Kali, my mother, really black? Swami Sarvadevananda spoke about this song last week. Is Kali, my mother, really black? The naked one of blackest hue lights the lotus of the heart. 
People say Kali is black, but my heart does not agree. She appears sometimes white, sometimes yellow, sometimes blue, sometimes red. I am unable to understand her, though my whole life has passed in trying. Sometimes Purusha, the masculine principle, sometimes Prakriti, the feminine principle. Sometimes she takes the form of the void. Striving to know her thus, Kamala Kanta has simply become mad. We get the sense that uh, this is reflecting Swami Vivekananda's own attitude. His whole life spent trying to understand the mother, and he has become simply mad. He requested the brothers to perform Kali Puja the next day to start making preparations. Of course, that was not possible. It was done about a month later. It was not possible because that evening, in meditation, Swami Vivekananda left his body. And we like to think, I like to think that uh, his offering is complete. Was he again saying, as he wrote to Josephine McLeod, I come, mother, I come, in thy warm bosom, floating wheresoever thou takest me. And perhaps the last verse of his Sanskrit hymn on the Divine Mother, the Ambastotram, can hint, give us a hint of his mood. Whether I succeed or fail, she who has ever inspired my understanding on the earth, who devising sweet, playful ways has led me since my birth along the most painful paths to perfection, she, the mother, the all, is my refuge. <laughs>